Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Esri Press Interviews. Joseph Kursky here. I serve as education manager for Esri on the education industry team. And today, I'm so thrilled. We've got Chris Carter here, author of Introduction to Human Geography Using ArcGIS Online. And he's also professor of geography at Long Beach City College in California, USA. Now, Chris has got over 15 years of experience teaching human geography and GIS, and I've been a fan of his for a long time, as well as courses on human and world ge regional geography and economic geography. Now, if you attended a past ESRI user conference, you might recognize him as a presenter on crime patterns. So Chris has got lots of different uh, areas of expertise, and Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. I'd like to hand this over to you for, for a bit, give you a chance to talk about yourself and your work. Okay, thanks, uh, Joseph. Um, as you said, my name is Chris Carter and I teach at Long Beach City College, um, where I teach human geography along with world regional geography, economic geography, geographic information systems. Um, uh, really, my, my specific background within geography is more of the demographic, economic side of, of geography. And I did my work, my research, my uh, dissertation research in Latin America, specifically in Chile. So I consider myself really uh, most familiar uh, in terms of world regions with Latin America and again, specifically Chile. I, I lived there for a year when I did my dissertation research. And then I had a sabbatical back in 2008 where I went back to Chile with my family and we lived there for a year and I taught at the University of La Serena for a year and we make regular trips back to, to uh, Chile. My wife is from there, uh, so, so uh, we, we get there frequently. Um, so really, I, I'm just, what, what I like about geography is um, how it helps us understand the world and especially when we travel when we see new places and also when we see our own our own communities um, geography gives us a, a feeling for uh, and an understanding of, of the processes of what is happening with, with the people and the economies and quality of life and the environment and, and all of those sorts of things so that's really what 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 I, I love about geography and about being a geographer well I appreciate it Chris it's great talking with you about all of this and you touched on this a little bit but maybe if you uh, could address this we're getting some interesting questions from the readers what led you into a teaching and instruction career well uh i think the reason i got into teaching geography is because i saw that as the best way to kind of keep doing geography <laughs> um so i initially actually my 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 bachelor's degree is in sociology um, I discovered geography when I signed up for the master's program um, at San Diego State University. And I was interested initially in the environmental side of geography. That's what drew it to drew me to um, geography. But once I got into the program, I realized I was moving back to my sociological side. Uh, and I, I was interested more in the demographics and economics and 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 more of the human geography um, types of things. So, um, I finished the master's, worked for a short time as an urban planner, and realized I, I wanted to get back into more geography, so I signed up for the PhD program, the joint San Diego State UC Santa Barbara PhD program, and, and uh, continued my studies there. And, and really, in the PhD program, I saw that teaching looked like a, a great career and a great way to, to pursue geography uh, for, for the rest of my life. <laughs> Chris, we've got some some folks that are interested in writing, uh, writing GIS or geo specific textbooks. Could you explain a little bit about your writing process uh, and any maybe writing tips for people aspiring to write such a book? Well, uh, yeah, when I started writing this book, I, I was kind of starting from scratch. I mean, I'd written before and wrote my dissertation, but trying to uh, you know, put together a book is somewhat different. So I really just found that what worked for me was was creating good outlines. So initially making an outline of the chapters that I wanted to cover, but starting with that. And then within each chapter, um, really breaking down what are the concepts that I have to cover in each chapter. So in this case, I, I, I reviewed multiple uh, human geography textbooks. I reviewed the AP human geography uh, various study guides, and I, I looked for what concepts were covered in all of them. 
uh, because different books will have some differences to them, but every book covers, you know, some the basics. So I made sure I had that, and then I wanted to add, um, you know, additional information to that. So I, I saw what was necessary, put that into a chapter outline, and then had to work out the order that would make more sense, um, you know, moving from one topic to another within the book. So creating good outlines, I think, was is the most important you know that could be by finding the right topics uh but then also working you know do you want to look at it by scale starting at a global scale and then moving down to more local um scales as you work through the chapter or whatever but you, a, a, a good outline is the most important and isn't that one of the nice things that we love about geography right is that you've got different scales that you can incorporate different themes so i imagine it's a challenge to OK, what do I include and then what do I leave out? Because geography is the study of the whole world, right? And everything is in it that is in it. So th that That's must be true. a challenge. What about your specific human geography book? What questions did you hope to answer in that book? Well, when I when I set out to write the book, I was really aiming it at uh, lower division, introductory college students and AP human geography high school students. So that was my target group that I was that, that I was aiming towards. Um, I therefore I had to cover all of the main important concepts that are covered in human geography. Um, but more broadly, what I really wanted to do was was present human geography uh, in, in more of an applied sense. So mine, some books may be a bit heavier on the theory. Um, and of course, I cover the, the the theories, but the focus is how do you take these theories and use them in the real world? So the examples I use within the exercises and within the text, um, my my way of thinking was if I worked for the World Bank or the United Nations or my local uh, planning department or the city economic development department or the U.S. Census Bureau, what skills and what knowledge would I need? Uh, to be able to work in those agencies. And, and that's why I think human geography is so exciting because it does provide both the theoretical background and the applied skills to work in these, these agencies, international, national, and local agencies. So I really wanted that to come out in the book. You know, for a student who's 17, 18, 19, 20 years old and is just getting started into, into um, their studies, how can this help be their first step towards towards working at one of these types of organizations. That was my mm -hmm. goal. And one of the things I love about your book, Chris, is that we're always trying to help educators and students see GIS as a, a viable tool, set of data, and also a way of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about the book. You've got it interwoven with, okay, here is, a theme like climate or population change and GIS is a viable tool to help us understand those fundamental concepts in human geography. Um, and I'm curious, how did you start using GIS geospatial technology in the classroom and what was the reaction from students and faculty? Right. Well, for many years, I've been trying to figure out the best way to incorporate GIS into my non GIS classes. Um, and I found it to be kind of a struggle. Um, until ArcGIS Online came around. Um, because with the desktop version, you would always have to find a lab on campus, or if you wanted students to work at home, they would have to be able to install it themselves. And it was just technically too difficult. Um, but once Arc ArcGIS Online came around and they could open it on a web browser anywhere, um, that really changed things. So um, I started doing it with when I started writing this book. <laughs> really is when I started to integrate it. Um, the uh, feedback has been good. Students like it. The way I do my uh, live on campus classes, you know, if the class meets twice a week, uh, one day, uh, one class meeting, a lecture about the material from the textbook. And then the second one, second day, we will meet in a lab and work through the exercises. And so um, it, it's 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 working out well. The students seem to enjoy it. Um, also, um, with uh, some of the other faculty on campus, um, I haven't been able to get other people to use GIS, but a lot of faculty in other departments are aware of it. 
Uh, so one nice thing is, for example, our anthropology degree now has um, GIS, not the specific human geography, but GIS um, as an elective for their transfer degree. And sociology is adding GIS to their transfer degree. Um, geology and environmental science professors uh, recommend that students take my GIS class. Um, so, so GIS is being used in many different disciplines uh, and faculty are aware of that. So, uh, that is great to hear about the progress. And that's one of the central focus areas too of, of a lot of us in GIS and education. We're always keen to get it into other disciplines, right? Because we feel so passionately about it. What about this, Chris? Uh, what do you see students most struggling with uh, in class? That, for some students using computers in general is still a struggle. Um, so many of them um, are familiar with working with cell phones and consuming information on cell phones, but sitting down and using a computer, many of them just aren't prepared. Uh, Long Beach is, um, it's a working class city. Uh, my students are from working class and immigrant backgrounds. Um, so it's not an exceptionally affluent city or student body. And so um, a challenge is some students um, just don't have a strong computer background. And then, um, some students, especially uh, when I teach online or for homework assignments, they're, they're trying to do it on their cell phones. They don't even have a computer at home. Mm -hmm. So that's a big challenge that you know, professors may not be aware of all the time. Um, and I've had students ask me a question. I'm stuck on something. I'll say, send me a screenshot. And they send a screenshot and it's on their phone. And I'm like, that's just going to be really difficult you know, to, to, to work with this on a, such a small screen. So that's one of the... the the main challenges um, that I see with students. That's um, a situation that we've seen with our massive open online courses as well, Chris, the MOOCs, where, you know, because they can't, they don't have the real estate on a phone, they're, they're trying to get to the finish button and they Correct. can't get to it. And, you know, that's all they've got, though. And, you right. know, kudos to them for right. attempting a whole MOOC on, the, on a phone. Yeah. But uh, that's the reality, like you're saying. Um, knowing that, uh, you know, we've got increasing interest in geospatial technology in a lot of different levels of education, not just in different disciplines, but different levels. We've got some high school teachers that uh, we've been spreading the word, and I know you've been spreading the word, to about your book. What advice would you give to those high school teachers who wants to incorporate GIS into his or her school? Well, um, First of all, my understanding is that high schools can get a free license to to yes. the SD software. Yes. So, so they need to know that first of all. That's very important. Um, and then, with that, my book um, when I when I designed the book and when I looked at the topics, I, I based it on um, some of the AP geography human geography standards. So the book is designed to fit well with the AP curriculum, um, and so. I would say it, it is well designed for for high school um, students. And one other thing kind of related to the previous question as well is that um, when when doing exercises in a lab with students, the, the the pace that they can work at is varies quite a bit. So I found that within, say, an hour and 15 minute class, um, I try to I, I've narrowed it down to tr just trying to do one, maybe two exercises from the book in that time period. And that gives you time. Some students will do it, finish it in a half hour. Others will need the full hour and 15 minutes. Um, but if I just do one, maybe two exercises, it gives you time to slow down, discuss things, um, talk in more depth about the, the discussion questions. So it's not just pushing buttons uh, for an hour. Um, then you can take a break and discuss some of the things that they're seeing. So, so that's one suggestion is just kind of keep it down to one or two exercises, possibly even just one in many cases for a class period. Well, thanks for that, Chris. Also, um, I love what you're saying. It is so important, as we know, in working, especially in the primary and secondary K through 12 curriculum, that it's that's sh that's shown every cur curricular piece that they use has to be proven to be connected to the standards, the state standards, the national mm -hmm. standards, and this goes with multiple countries too. Right. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I salute you for making sure that that was strong in there. What about this? You touched on this a bit, but a piece of advice perhaps that you would give to educators using your book? 
Well, yeah, I think kind of what I was saying previously, first of all, you need to gauge the, the speed and pace that your students can work at. And that will vary. Um, you know, that some schools, you, your students may be all uh, more at the, kind of the same level and you might be able to cover a bit more. Um, it, it, like I said, at Long Beach City College, there's, there's quite a bit of variation. So it's best to focus on just one or two um, so that everyone has, has a chance to um, complete the exercises. Another thing that I started doing, I wrote the book but I find myself modifying the exercises anyways. Um, so I would recommend modifying the exercises. You can add a couple of steps, cut out a, cut out a couple of steps, add in some, some different questions that apply to the way you present the material. Um, I, I do that myself. Um, and again, it, it, discussion questions might, might change based on the current events, things are in the news that fit into an exercise. Just plug that question in and add that in. So I, I really found that modifying the exercises is a useful thing to do and i'm doing it myself good point and now with web-based gis tools data it is easier than ever right to say well what if we looked at this variable or what if we took the same scenario and looked at this region instead of this region so Correct. yeah i'm right with you there Correct. okay what about this chris um if you wanted your readers of your book to take away one thing this is probably a challenge but one thing from reading your book Mm -hmm. What would that be? Well, one thing that uh, kind of as I was saying earlier, I want students to see that human geography is great for solving real world problems. It's really uh, uh, applicable to many things. So you just look at the chapters of the book, for instance. Um, you know, geographers, human geography, we look at issues of population growth. Um, you know, some places have fast growing populations. They have to deal with how are we going to educate all these kids and then find jobs for them once they become teenagers and young adults? Um, and we also, within population, we look at other countries where populations are shrinking, birth rates are very low, and then we have to, countries have to decide how are we going to pay for the pensions and health care as, as populations age um, within our cities? You know, how are, how are our cities growing and, and how do we deal with issues of housing and traffic? Um, migration is another chapter. Uh, it, that's a huge topic. How do we how do we deal with 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 migration around the world? It, it's, it presents both opportunities and challenges for the countries receiving immigrants. Um, it's, it's culturally and politically a, a, a fraught topic. Um, so all of these uh, global climate change and air pollution these are all topics covered in the book, and these are real things that we deal with on daily base a daily basis. So that's what I again what I love about human geography and what I wanted to express in this book is how it really helps us solve actual real world problems. Well said. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, well, I'd like to thank our author and educator Chris Carter for taking his time to talk with us today. And folks, you can find the Introduction to Human Geography using ArcGIS Online book that Chris has been chatting with us about at the Esri Merchandise Store and from select online retailers. Again, thanks, Chris. Much appreciated. I have a safe and happy rest of your week, and we will see you at the virtual user conference. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Joseph.